can make sense of whatever's about to happen. So, um, but I have to say, now, you guys are all in high school, is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, my young son's story actually starts in high school. Uh, and you're maybe thinking, well, that must mean because you're from Youngstown. No, actually, my, my Youngstown story starts in high school because I grew up in Central Texas. I grew up in a town called Brownwood, Texas, which claims to be the heart of Texas. So if you saw a map of Texas and you put your finger in what was roughly the middle, you're pretty close to where I went to high school. And um, my story starts there because Brownwood is a city that, um, when I was in high school, uh, it was still kind of drafting on its glory days. Back in the 70s and 80s, Brownwood High School had the best high school football team in the state of Texas, which is not a small claim, right? But their football team hadn't been good for over a decade, probably 20 years. But they still kind of had these illusions of grandeur. And so football was everything in high school. And for somebody like me, who I know it's gonna be shocking to hear, was not a cheerleader, um, that meant that my experiences in high school were kind of limited because a lot of our funding went to football and anything related to football. And I, I see a few nods, so maybe you can relate to that. I know, I know football is big in some of our area schools, and it means that other programs don't necessarily get a lot of funding. So I took theater and art for four years in high school. And I didn't ever really get to act because I was so good at building sets and I was kind of shy back then, believe it or not. I, uh, it was not so much that I was shy around people, but standing up on stage just seemed overwhelming. So I would get these small parts and then I would build amazing sets and come up with really cool props and costumes and things. So my senior year, when um, I had like two lines in the final play, I, I kind of quit theater halfway through the year and I doubled up on art and my art class was horrible. It was so bad. My art teacher um, at that time would, uh, she would give us a vague assignment, pass out supplies, and then she would go in her office and she would read romance novels <laughs> and sometimes smoke cigarettes. Uh, you weren't supposed to do that, but uh, you could smoke in the teacher's lounge back then, which was kind of still, it was really dated. Most schools at that point had eliminated smoking. They were non-smoking campuses. But our school still let teachers smoke in the teacher's lounge because we were kind of old school. Anyway, it wasn't a great experience. I, I left high school thinking, wow, um, I, what did I even learn? And I went to college and I met all these people who had portfolios and had all these cool experiences and I'd gone to like big city schools and and I, I had to work really hard in college. And I went to college in my hometown, and it was a small school, uh, much smaller than YSU. But it's a similar thing. Like, if you go to YSU, um, you probably have heard people talk about, oh, I'm not going to go to YSU. I'm going to go away for college. And so there's a little bit of a stigma. If you go to the college where you went to high school, right? Um, but I did. And I actually got a really good education because all of my classes were taught by professors. I never had a grad student teach a class once, not even one time did a grad student teach my class. They were all um, professors who were highly trained in their field. And um, as a result, I, you know, I had a lot of small classes and I got a lot of good information. And it actually ended up being a blessing in disguise. So even though I went to school at home, I, uh, I, ha I had a lot of opportunity to sort of make up what I, what I was lacking from my high school experience. But I still was in my hometown. And the goal is, when you are young, is to get out, right? How many of you feel like that might have that urge, that you're yearning to go somewhere else, like see the rest of the world? That's good, that's normal. In fact, I would say to everybody in here, if you love Youngstown or you love your town, if you love the Mahoning Valley, if you love this area, the best thing you can do is go away for a little bit. Go away, and if you really want to live here forever, come back. Because the most interesting people I meet here are people who spent some time away and chose to come back. And in a way, I'm like, uh, I'm sort of like coming home. And let me say a little bit more about that. Um, Brownwood, where I grew up, is slightly smaller than Youngstown but it's a very similar demographic. A lot of the adults in that town haven't attended college. A lot of them have worked in 
industrial manufacturing. We have a large 3M factory there and a large Kohler factory. So lots and lots of people in my hometown made toilets. So if you feel like people in this area have low self-esteem, imagine if lots of the adults in your community made toilets for a living. That's where I grew up. And so the, the morale is kind of low, right? Uh, but in general, I, I saw a few people who would move to our town who weren't from there, and they would say the weirdest things about Brownwood. They would say, this is such a great place to live. And we had a lot of people who would retire from um, cities around the U.S. to my hometown. I'm like, why are they coming here? This place sucks. <clears throat> and you may have heard things like this about your hometown, too. Uh, you may have even thought them at times. But here's the interesting thing. The one thing I learned about growing up in Brownwood and then moving away and then moving on purpose to a town like Brownwood, only frankly I would say like Youngstown is better, honestly, uh, because A, it's bigger, it's a beautifully designed town, um, and it has a lot of assets that um, if you're not from here, you might find surprisingly exciting. Um, so there's a lot of things here that I've never had in any of the places I've lived. I've, little, I've lived a lot of places around the US. So, um, but I chose to come here. And I chose to come here partly because uh, I can relate to the experiences of people who grew up here. I understand to some extent where you're coming from. That weird tension of simultaneously feeling a little embarrassed of your town, but also feeling like super loyal. That is my experience. And I still have a lot of friends I grew up with in Central Texas who will say like, this place is the pits, it's awful. Well, they'll say other things, but I won't say those things, okay? And then if somebody from somewhere else comes to our town and says, wow, this place really is awful, they will say, I'll fight you, this place is awesome. And I, and I think that's what I loved about growing up there. I have to say, the fact that we could be frustrated but we could also be fiercely loyal, and we could, and it, and it had everything to do with the people, and that's what I realized. So, what's the point of all this? I, I, my advisor in grad school used to say, "Well, I told you that story, so I could tell you this story." So I'm going to use this trick. Um, so I, I tell you all that because what I really want to say is, my Youngstown story is not about Youngstown per se. It's about how you look at the world. And one of the things I learned from growing up in Brownwood and living in Pennsylvania and Florida and traveling all over the United States and, and now choosing Ohio is that you and your town are not just about the sort of number of people in it or who specifically is in it or what that town even looks like. It's an organic, constantly changing thing. So this area is a completely different place than it was 10 years ago. And if you look at that objectively, and you say, like, what are the things that have changed, we can, we can agree, right? But if you think about it in terms of sort of the way we assemble facts and history in our brain, we tend to be thinking of all of it simultaneously. And that's the thing that finally made sense to me about my hometown. Why was it such that people could hate it and love it at the same time? That's a weird thing, right? To love and hate something equally, simultaneously. And it's because so much of the way that we situate ourselves is related to just one component, and that's history. And it's looking at an accrual of experiences. But the reason I can choose Youngstown and move here and love Youngstown differently than maybe you guys would love Youngstown, because I didn't grow up here, is that I come here and I see what's here now. And I hear about this city, and I see this city through a different lens. I can relate to it because I grew up in a place like it, but I don't have a specific history that colors my view. So, and who, the, and who you are as an adult, that's the same thing. Uh, it, it's true of a city, it's true of a person. And I think when we look at a city, and we, we think of a city just in terms of its history and in its mythology, I, I, I very often talk about a mythology of Youngstown. This idea that and you've heard stories, right, where something kind of like balloons and like, oh my gosh, this happened, and then this happened, and oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, and it's almost like a modern day myth, right? There's a certain mythology to each town. And I think we have to kind of consciously think about what that means for our lived experience and also what it might mean for you as a person. So you're in high school, and I'm not asking you to rat yourself out, 
but I guarantee that everybody in this room at some point has experienced mythology in high school about a person. And it turns out that somebody said something about somebody, and it's scandalous, right? It might be like super gross, it might be super inappropriate, they might have gotten in trouble, but, it's, but it becomes this thing, this myth, and it suddenly becomes who they are. And it suddenly is like sort of what we immediately think of when we think of that person. Somebody who kind of stands outside of the social norms or somebody who's done something great. It doesn't matter if it's awful or awesome. Suddenly, that person's identity is about the mythology. And what I want us to really think about is living in the present and living in the future. And, um, and how we kind of combat that mythology and, and sort of rationally look at this notion of what constitutes assets. And assets in sort of the free market world often means stuff like stuff you could sell, right? When I say like, what are your assets? You're like, well, you know, I have like, um, I have some furniture in my room I could sell. I have like, a, I have a pretty nice bike. Uh, but when we talk about assets in a community, it's something a little different. Um, assets in a community aren't always things that you could sell or trade. They aren't always things that are commodity. They are, um, they're complex things and they change a lot. So the assets that Youngstown has now are very different than the assets that Youngstown had in 1960, and that's a, that's a big thing that people talk about, but I don't think we live in that present sometimes. I think very often we kind of find ourselves um, trapped in the past or sort of distracted by shiny objects. Um, and <clears throat> so my Youngstown story really is about the long answer to what I am often asked. I have people from here who look at me and they look, kind of, they kind of try to look deeply, like look into your soul. Um, and they say, why did you come here? The long answer is because of assets and not because of mythology. I came here because Youngstown has so much to offer. And the short answer is I drove uh, four hours a day, three to four hours a day in traffic to work at a really prestigious job in Dallas at one point in life when I lived in Texas. And I hate traffic. And the cool thing about living in Youngstown is it's a well-designed city. Our city planners years ago um, designed this city for a lot more people. So it means there's never any traffic and you can get anywhere from any point in this town to any suburb in 20 to 30 minutes, right? That's kind of the running joke that we say, oh, it takes 20 minutes. And that's usually pretty true. If you map it, it's like 15, 15 to 30 minutes to go anywhere. And I think like that's a, that's a major asset. For those of you who ever have to drive in traffic, if you go somewhere else, move to New York. Spend a couple years in New York. I guarantee you, after two years of New York traffic, you'll want to be back in Youngstown. Um, and not just because traffic is awful, but because Youngstown is awesome. And we have an amazing group of assets. So um, I think that's probably it. In terms of the future, though, you asked what, you know, like what's my, my vision for the future has everything to do with kind of living in the present. Um, I think that if we are aware of the assets and we work to kind of focus on what those assets are and how we can kind of encourage people to develop assets, whether that's a community group that's making a difference whether that's a small organization that's planting trees, it's a group of Boy Scouts who take on a project who um, want to build some things or repair some things in our local parks, if it's a group of environmental people who are trying to deal with long-term industrial pollution, or if it's a group of young people who are just trying to create a social network for each other. Whatever it is, um, focusing on what's happening now. And, and putting aside the mythology and putting aside our predisposed notions of what somebody might be like because of where they grew up. I hear a lot of really funny mythology that relates to, well, you know, they're just, they're just from Austin town and they moved to Boardman and they think they're hot stuff now. <laughs> I, I mean, have you heard this, right? Like, now it's, it, is it just me? Okay, anyway, I've heard these kinds of things and I think that's the kind of mythology I'm talking about. I don't care where you came from, and that's not to say it doesn't matter, but it doesn't mean that, I'm go that I would 
tell you you can't participate in something I'm doing in terms of a community initiative. On the direct level, um, what my sort of involvement is in the future of Youngstown is thinking about meaningful ways to support the arts here and to help Youngstown do a little bit of what Pittsburgh has done, and that's to transition from a 20th century industrial city to a 21st century, 21st century post-industrial tech city. We have, a lot of, um, we have a lot of potential for this place to become a magnet for um, high tech industry and also for the arts and for creative industries. And there's lots and lots of evidence to show that encouraging artists and providing opportunities for artists can singly and with no other outside influence completely transform a community. We've got lots of examples of that around the nation. And I think that Youngstown has a lot of raw talent. There are a lot of amazing people here, including in this room. I mean, you guys are awesome. And you're ultimately the future of Northeast Ohio. So what if I told you that we could give you uh, funding to start whatever your idea is? If you have some idea and you think, like, I want to open a shop that does blank, or I want to do this public art project. And I said, OK, here's some money. Would that make a difference? Probably, it's enough to kind of get you out there and get you visible. And so my interest is in working with RJ and other community members to try to figure out ways to provide opportunities that help build on our current assets. Because we've got a lot. We have a lot of cool things going on here. That's about it. <laughs> okay. Uh, questions? You have like 100 questions for Jamal. Can you talk a little bit about art education and what you're doing here? And the like, you've seen a lot of the schools and yeah. things like that. Yeah. How many like of you have taken? How many of you have taken an art class in school? Yeah. So somebody has to somebody has to teach your teacher how to do what they do. And art education has changed a lot over the years. Uh, it, it is a constantly transforming field, like any other specialized field, right? Uh, thankfully, medicine follows the same model, right? We don't practice uh, medicine the same way we did in 1980. So we probably shouldn't practice art education the same way we did in 1980, right? We have to kind of keep transforming. So some of what I'm interested in in terms of art education is helping teachers be responsive to social issues and to look at teaching art from a standpoint that isn't just a formula. So it's not just about following steps. Uh, how many of you have heard that cliche phrase, think outside the box? Yeah, what does that mean to you? Anything? I mean, you hear it so much these days. Yeah. Yeah, don't you? But is that an easy thing to do in K-12? Do you find it, do you find a lot of opportunities in high school to go off script? Yeah, that's cool. I know some high schools um, provide more opportunities than others in terms of that. Yes? Do you ever wonder, like, how could we possibly think outside the box when how we think is how we are and they tell us we're never really going to change unless we want to, but how can we change something that's final? 